How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? I'm not bad, thank you very much. Yeah. It look, by the way you're dressed, I'm thinking it's perhaps a little bit warmer where you are than it is where I am. Are you in Belfast? <laughs> I am in Belfast, yes. It's uh, six degrees centigrade here. Oh, I see. Yeah, I've been in. I'm in. I'm in Singapore, so it's quite. It's quite quite different. Yeah, that's quite good. Yeah, you look like you're on holiday. That's excellent. Yeah, well, I've been here for one year, so it's been nice. I got to wear Hawaiian shirts for one year straight. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I like it. That's very nice. Cool. Well, wait. Look, I've no. Uh, I've no idea why you could. Um, I've no idea why you could possibly want to talk to me. I'm sure I haven't got anything of the slightest interest to tell you. So. Okay. <laughs> First, first, okay. First question I have for you, uh, Martin. What what drew you to studying theology in Oxford? Oh God! Well, uh, <laughs> we're st straight in. Straight in. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, crikey, it's still early. God, I need to I need to engage my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not re remotely religious myself personally, but I'm very interested in these things, and I think. Uh, I think it's one, anything to do with sort of uh, theology or spirituality, it's one subject that everybody has some sort of opinion on. Every single person on the planet has got something to say about what they think or what they believe or what they don't believe or what they like or dislike or whatever it is. Everybody has something to say about that. So whether, you, whether you're religious or not, it, it somehow affects all of us in a way that very few things do. So I think that's very interesting. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I suppose because I, I grew up here in Northern Ireland through the 1970s and 80s and through the very sort of worst bits of the troubles. We, we, had, a, we had a lot of uh, political unrest here and, uh, you know, um, trouble and people being killed and people being blown up and all this kind of stuff, you know. And this was happening every day whenever I was growing up as a child, you know. And then um, whenever I became a little bit older, I suppose I, you know, because some of that, not all of it, but some of that is is uh, on the surface is kind of politically or religiously motivated a lot of the trouble that we have and the trouble that still goes on to this day. So I suppose I wanted to understand a little bit more about what, you know, what the hell is going on here, you know? So I thought that this, it might be interesting to, to take a look, you know? It's uh, interesting because I, I was a, a comparative religion major in, in, in- Oh, there you go. Well, there you are. So we have, we have something reading. in common straight away. Yeah, I remember reading a book by Paul Tillich, right? Uh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Courage to be, I think it was. And I, I really, I, I liked his writing because uh, I like the idea of it, you know, that people have, especially, I guess, in the era in which he was writing these books, which I think was the 50s, uh -huh. an inclination to sort of explore existentialism, right? Because yeah. you live in a world kind of post-Second World War and you're like, maybe there is no God. And I, and I kind of Ooh. found it interesting that for him, the pathway was you almost have to go through existentialism to understand that at the end of it, there's nothing there, right? And it's yeah. so demoralizing that you kind of go back and you're like, you know what, I I can't go this way. I have to believe in some some uh, some greater power, you know. Existentialism also cracks me up because it's the only. It has to be French people. It can only be French people to create existentialism. Uh, <laughs> it's so angry. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, so that, I don't know. It's something that's of great interest to me, you know. And I, I always, uh, like, I still, I still do. I still, to this day, I still find it very, very interesting. It doesn't really, I don't know. It doesn't really inform what I do now at all. It doesn't really get any connection with it, you know. But, uh, but I, I don't know. I sort of feel that it's something that I've always had a, a great interest in. I always wondered, actually, if I hadn't done watchmaking, would I have continued with some sort of, um, sort of academic research in that area you know I, I, that's that's always been in the back of my mind I think there's a possibility that I might have done something like that you know I like the really uh, I like the really um, sort of I like the sort of stuff that people don't tend to look at very much you know I like the sort of uh, all the sort of apocalyptic literature stuff and I like studying comparative religions and I study Buddhism and you know all this kind of stuff and I, I find all that really really fascinating you know but yeah I don't know, but what the problem is, the problem I have today is that watchmaking is uh, watchmaking consumes me completely, and and every bit of my life is taken up with watchmaking, and there's just you know there's no room for anything else. So it's because watchmaking is a watchmaking is a very jealous mistress, <laughs> and uh, this it's everything is just every everything is sacrificed to watchmaking. So unfortunately, all that stuff, all of my my those, and other interests like that, I, I don't really have any time to pursue. You know. 
So, so you know, I wanted to talk to you, Stephen, because I own the watch that you created with Max, and it's oh, cool. one of my favorite timepieces. Excellent. And, and, yeah, and I asked Max, so tell me the the story behind this watch. Tell me the human story. <laughs> Who is this? Who is this client? <laughs> <laughs> so that, no, well, he told me something really fascinating. So he said that um, the the relationship he had with you uh, came out of one of the you know biggest crises that he's ever had, faced in his life, which was basically when um, STT just basically gave him a bunch of parts. Um, they were supposed to give him delivered, you know, delivered, finished, assembled, delivered movements, but they had under you know, undergone a restructuring because of new ownership, and they were like, "Hey, just come pick up your stuff." Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he says that, and it's quite funny because I can imagine this. He said he's, he's not a groveling type of person, but he was really <laughs> groveling in that meeting, begging them not to do this, but they were adamant. And so um, I think Peter Speak basically kind of took him by the arm and just walked him out of the, out of the, out of the room before he, you know, he truly lost it. And then they were in a car driving back to, I imagine, Geneva, and Peter Speak started calling different watchmakers up and, and seeing if they could, uh, um, uh, you know, recruit them for this, this kind of crazy project of trying to reverse engineer and re or reverse assemble Max's movements. Um, is that how you got involved in this project through Peter Speak? The story begins, and I, I came to Switzerland in 2001. I went to Neuchâtel to study at Wallstep in Neuchâtel, and uh, I ended up staying in Switzerland and stayed on at Wastep and trained to become an instructor and so on and so forth, you know. And then as time went on, I became more and more interested in, uh, in because I was never born to be a teacher. I was somebody who fell into teaching accidentally. And I really liked it, you know, but I was never going to be a teacher like long term. So uh, I, I enjoyed that. But I felt as time went on sort of into 2005, 2006, uh, I think felt that I'd like to see but if I could maybe do this crazy thing and become like independent, you know, and start to, you know, sell it by myself. And uh, so one of the people I went to speak to when I was considering making this big move was was Peter Speak, you know, because I, I was friends with uh, Stephen McGonagall, who's another independent watchmaker from Ireland. And Stephen knew Peter, so uh, it was actually Stephen who, who got us together. Stephen made the appointment for me, and then I, I drove up and I saw Peter in his workshop, which was then in Roll, just outside Geneva. And yeah, so I became friendly with Peter and he, uh, we, we got on well and I started doing little bits of work for him and little bits and pieces, you know, so from that point on, we were in contact. And then that's how it's true. Peter had been working on this project with Max, the, with Max, the, the um, horological machine number one, of which Peter's one of the contributors, you know. And then you're quite right, this thing with Max, this whole thing with the organization that he'd been working with, they they decided they didn't want to bother anymore. They weren't interested. So they, you're right, they literally just, uh, they got him to open his boot and they threw all the parts in the back of his car and off he went, you know. So yeah, that's right. So I think it's because I had been, I'd been becoming friends with Peter for the last probably two years at that point, you know, then whenever this came up, there was a group of sort of people working independently and, and uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, three, four, five of us. And, and you know, he, I was one of the people that he rang. So I remember we, uh, we, then, we all went to Peter's workshop. We were all called to Peter's workshop uh, with Max. And we were all sitting around this table. And I'd never, I, to be honest with you, truthfully, I'd never met Max before. And I'd never, I knew nothing about him. So this was the first time to in, encounter this guy, you know. Yes, it was interesting. We were all there and, uh, you know, we met Max and we, we heard about what had happened and, it was interesting, you know, because the, at that point, the pro normally how these things would go is the company would make the parts and they would they would make prototypes, you know, they would assemble everything, find what doesn't work, fix the problems. And then what Max expected actually was, was to have completed watches delivered, you know. What he was actually getting was a set of parts which hadn't even been through the prototyping stage. So the problem with that is, you know, you, you, you assemble all these bits that uh, way and then you, you find that maybe it works. Maybe it works badly. Maybe it doesn't work at all. You don't know what you're going to find, you know, uh, because normally all that would be done within the support of the organization who've been actually creating the parts and the master, you know, who've been overseeing the actual mechanical part of the development. So we had this bunch of parts, three or four guys, and then we just went off with kits and we started building it and, you know, to find out what works, what doesn't work, and then how can we fix the problems? How can we remake the parts? How can we redesign what isn't making sense so that the thing is actually going to go? So... It was, a, it, it was right, it was completely, it was the totally backwards, you know, the, as you would say, the arse about face way to, to approach a project like that, you know, so it was, a, it was, in, it was interesting, yeah, and, and we, you know, we got there and, and it worked, so I don't know, I suppose, I suppose the outcome was okay. I remember Max being very, as I said, I'd never met him before, but I remember he seemed very nervous 
about whatever was going on. <laughs> um, I, yeah, he's I not a guy. You, you mean you, you know him? He's not a guy who is he, nervousness is never the an emotion I would associate with Max Boozer. Quite the opposite, you know. He's a guy who exudes confidence, and uh, but you know that that's that's how it happened. So it was from small beginnings, yeah. So you know we we did that we, we did that together. I worked on that right through the prototyping. We got it all working, and then I. I, I assembled, I don't know, 10 or 20 of the actual production pieces, you know. And, you know, we all got on well, and um, Max and I always stayed in touch. And I think we always, I think we always had, I think both of us had a feeling that it would be somehow interesting to, you know, do something else together. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it was interesting because Max also described you as the guy who kind of very rapidly took charge of that project, the LM1 project. And I guess one of the big issues was, you know, if things weren't working, um, which of course, you know, with a, a watch or a movement that hadn't been prototyped, that kind of happens, right? Uh, he said that you would just go make parts so that um, it would work. Well, that's, that's what you have to do. He said, I, I was fortunate in that, they, that I, have a, I have a pretty complete workshop, you know, so I've got all the lathes and, you know, jig bores and milling machines and odds and ends, all of which is sitting beside me. You can't really see, but it's all over here on one side. <coughs> so I had all the stuff that I need, you know, to be, to be pretty independent in terms of I can make part. I don't have to or, order stuff from suppliers and it takes weeks and weeks. You know, if you need a, if you need a spring or a lever or something, I can, I can design it this morning and pop it out by lunchtime, you know, so I, I'm pretty reactive in that sense, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I was well placed with all the equipment to, you know, to design and make whatever was needed and do it, do it rapidly. Also modify the parts that were there. I remember us modifying the bridges and, you know, doing all that sort of, that sort of stuff. So, I, you know, again, I'm in a position I can set the part up on the machine, you know, retouch it or modify whatever's necessary. And, and, you know, half an hour later, you've got your modified bridge. Whereas if you send that off to a company to do, you'll have to wait, you know, two months or something, you know. So, yeah, so the, 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 the advantage of being equipped is that you, you can be pretty reactive like that you know so yeah i was we, we we just we literally fixed the problems as we found them it was kind of Amazing. totally you know hand to mouth approach you know you find you come against one one problem what do we do how do we fix it we had a few meetings we all discussed the things you know how are we going to do this and, and it just moved forward so it actually do you know actually it, it was quite a good it, it wasn't the worst i've seen i've seen projects actually be um approached in a much more sort of logical, organized way, which actually proceeded much, much worse <laughs> in a funny way. I won't ask so, you which one, so sorry. <laughs> it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's perhaps not the worst approach. I don't know, I think, uh, I don't know. I, I, I was surprised how we, we, all, we got it all working relatively quickly and then the, the watches were being popped out for the production and, you know, and they were being sold, so. So then, you know, I like I love to learn a little bit more about how um, you guys began to embark on the perpetual calendar project. Um, Max had mentioned, I think he was having a conversation with Peter Speak again, and Peter Speak had said, "Oh, um, you had you you ended up in a situation where you were supposed to be working on a big project with um, a brand, but unfortunately, that brand had gone under or something like that." And and uh, and and then so Max decided to reach out. And, and you guys started to have a conversation and then you proposed a perpetual calendar, which was not something he was thinking of. How do you remember it? No, well, yeah, that's, that, that's all true. That, that's exactly true. What, what actually happened was I was working on a thing. It, it was myself, it, it was really, a, it was a project with, with Peter Speak, but Peter Speak was not the, Peter Speak had involved an investor. You see, right. Peter's, a, Peter's a great guy and Peter had involved this investor. And, um, and it was really the investor who was financing this project that, that Peter and I were working on, you see. So I, I had designed this whole big thing. And um, Peter thought, I don't know, Peter saw something in me, you see. Peter th thought that I should pursue this idea rather than just, rather than, he, he thought I should pursue construction and design, you see, movement, construction and design. And he kept pushing me to learn this, you know, and to, to try it, you know, because I I never studied this. I, I'm self-taught as a movement constructor and designer, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it has pluses and minuses to it, but that's another story. But anyway, we I designed this big load of stuff and Peter thought it was interesting and we were pushing forward with this. But it was only possible with this investor because the investor was the financial backing to it all, you see. And that's, that's the problem that we had because... Uh, in, in all good faith, this the investor just decided, he just literally decided he didn't want to do it anymore. He didn't want to continue with it. So uh, it was, from my point of view, it was a disaster because I'd been working on this thing for quite a while. And 
uh, suddenly this it's been what I've been doing all day, every day, all my life poured into this thing, and suddenly the rug is pulled from under your feet. Peter on his side, Peter felt really guilty because Peter's a good guy, and Peter felt really guilty that this thing, which you know he had sort of been overseeing uh, with this investor, suddenly he had uh, this the, 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 he didn't it was beyond his control to get this to, to, to change the situation because financially speaking, the project relied on this guy to to keep it going. You see. So Peter felt terrible that uh, this had happened, and he also felt terrible that suddenly I had no income. I mean, I, I literally had no income. There was it was it was curtains, you see. And so what we did was, Peter said, "Okay, this was like a this was like a month and a half or two months before the Basel Fair in goodness, I don't know what year, maybe 2012, something like that." And and uh, and Peter said, "Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to use some of the interesting elements that you have designed." And he said, we're going to take one or two of these things and we're going to put them together and do a watch, okay? And he said, you're going to make it and you're going to make this thing in six weeks. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to show it at the Basel Fair. I'll sell it and that way we'll, we'll be able to um, stay out of debtor's prison. Okay, <laughs> so, so that's what I did. So we, I designed it. We took a few elements I had floating about. Uh, I, just, I, put, I put the design, it was really a module. It wasn't a complete watch, it was a module. So I, I put together the design of this module in like a weekend. And uh, then I worked day and night on it for six weeks. So I worked seven days a week until, you know, from six in the morning until 10 o'clock at night every day. And I finished the watch for Basel and gave it to Peter. And, uh, and it's, an, it's a, I have to say, it's a nice little thing. I was quite proud of it, actually. You know, it's this kind of R's operating thing. It's quite cool. And um, anyway, I said, I, I had always thought about Max, you see, I'd always thought about Max as, a, a, as somebody to work with or maybe something in the future that could be some potential here, you know. And what I said to Peter was, I remember to this day, I said to Peter, when you go to the fair, because I wasn't going to go to battle, I was so, I, all my confidence was shattered and I was just in a heap at home. So I said to Peter, take the watch, right? And, and I said, keep it in your pocket. And I said, if you can get a private moment, please, Peter, Show it to Max. Show it to Max and tell him I did it. And Peter, so this was like this was like my, if you like, my calling card, you know. So Peter did that, and he had it with him. And uh, I mean, the, what that little watch is now sold. It's with a collector somewhere <clears throat> long ago. But anyway, he showed it to Max, and and uh, I think Max was impressed. And then not long after Basel, we raced, we, we 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 met up. We we made contact again after the dust had settled after Basel. We got together, and with them, we, we, that's how we then started to discuss. Uh, he realized that, you know, what, what I was trying to say with the little watch was I was trying to say, look, this is what I can do, and I really do need to do something. And if you'd be interested in hiring me to make the coffee or clean the floor or something like that, you know, I'd be delighted. And so uh, soon after Basel, the, the little watch had done its work. We got together, and we and Max seemed interested in hiring me for some sort of project. There you go. Could I ask you, what, what was the little watch? It was a watch. It didn't really have any sort of function. It was a watch with it, with three sets of hands. So instead of just arm minute, it had arm minute, but three sets of arm minute hands. You see, and oh, so it's quite nice. And what it, what it, the, the the problem with three sets of hands is, you see, always you've got play in the gears. You have a lot of play, and uh, if you if you turn the crown forwards and backwards, for example, what you want is that all the minute hands move exactly together. Not that you've one flopping about and this one flopping about, and they're a little bit hesitant. You want them to move absolutely crisply all together. And, and what I had done, what the thing I had designed is I, I designed a system to eliminate the play from all the gears. So it, all the gears were double. You know, for each each gear, actually each gear was in two. And there was a, top, a lower and upper gear in each pair. And there was an artificial tension created between the pairs. And it's the artificial tension which eliminates all the play. So all the hands moved absolutely crisply. It was cool. And um, and I, I you know I did all the finishing and stuff you know and uh, and and that's that was the little watch as I say somebody has it some collector has it somewhere now you know but um, that's that's what it was I have photographs of it you know oh that's cool can you see yeah that's fantastic so you see there's three sets of hands and what what you have basically is the same mechanism repeated three times over and if you if you look I don't know if I if I if I um, if I if I move in, can you see can you see me moving in? Yeah. So, so if you if you it's not the photograph's not very clear, but if you look, you can see the gears are double. Yes. You see most of the gears are actually double. There's actually two, one on top of the other. So 
the, the artificial tension is the thing at the center, the big pinion in the center. And then it, it runs each set of gears in a double sense so that the minute hands are absolutely crisp. There's no, there's no wobbling around, you see. So that's what it is. So, I, so, so everything, you see, everything you see I made in sort of six weeks, I made, I made all the gears. <laughs> uh, the, I made the dial. I made the background. I did the case is a speak marine case, and the hands are speak marine hands. Yeah, and you that probably recognise Peter Shape. So that's there. You go. That's that's what it is. So that was my little. So that's the watch that Max saw at Basel, which which made him think, okay, maybe it's worth taking a punt on this guy. I suppose. <laughs> Amazing. So, at what point did you start discussing a perpetual calendar? It really it was straight away. The perpetual calendar is one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. I was interested in then, and I had this idea just in the back of my head about this, this different approach. This, how, you know, the perpetual calendar is a thing which has been done, apart from one or two exceptions, it's been done almost exactly the same way for, I don't know, 150 years or however long it is. For me, there's a very, there was a very clear way to do this differently and, and better. So I, I just said this. It, all I had was an idea. It wasn't any more than an idea. It wasn't a developed um, movement or a developed concept. It was just really a thought in the back of my mind about how this could be done differently. And the, and the, the key point was that the conventional calendar, what, what you have in the conventional calendar is a wheel with 31 teeth. 31 is the maximum number of days you can have in any month. So for your, for your wheel with 31 days, if, the, if it's March or, uh, you know, if it's March or December, you use all 31 teeth, that's fine. And then you go to the next month. But whenever it's a month which has got less than 31 days, at the very end of that month, what you'll do if you observe what's happening between the 30th of June and the 1st of July, you'll see that what the calendar does, the calendar skips over one tooth. So over, if you watch it over the process of two hours or something while it's changing, it'll go, it will actually read for 20 minutes or half an hour. The calendar will read the 31st of June. So this is crazy. You know, the 31st of June, come on. So it'll go from the 30th of June to the 31st of June, and then it'll finish up on the 1st of July. So what you're doing is you're always skipping over these days that you don't want because you've got too many days. So it's, the logical thing to me seemed to be, rather than do that, base the whole calendar on 28. So I'm working on a basis of 28, 28 being the shortest possible month, which is February. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the extra days for each month as I need them. So the, the, I always have the month, which is exactly the right length. I'm not trying to get rid of extra days. So I had an idea how to do that with a, with a wheel with shifting internal sectors. But that was all I had. I didn't have any more idea than that. There you go. There's the wheel. So that's it. Exactly. So, that, so this, this wheel has got um, moving sectors inside it. The pin that you see sort of above the center is that that pin is attached to all the internal sectors. So that, that pin moves from side to side and that moves all the internal teeth of the thing, which allows you to program to add in whatever number of days you need to add in. If you need to add in one day, two day, or three day, if you want to make the watch, a, if you want to use the, the, the month for a, for a month for a length of 28, 29, 30, or 31, you'll add in the appropriate number of days whenever the thing is programmed on the 25th of the month. On the 25th, you program according to the length of the current month. And then at the end of the month, the wheel, the big wheel that you see here, it will simply spit out the days that you've programmed on the 25th. So you, you don't have any skipping over days or any of that sort of stuff. So that was, that, that, that was the idea, but I think Max was initially not very, he wasn't looking to do a perpetual calendar, I think, because he'd had such a, he'd had, he'd had a very bad time with perpetual calendars. And I think he found that they were very problematic watches and uh, they were always coming back. They had, they had endless nightmares with the after sale service because these things were always coming back. That was interesting because uh, I remember Max saying to me as well at one of our early meetings, he said, you know, the watch has to be, he said it has to be completely foolproof. Locations are, are, are assembled with, with the, they're assembled with the really, those are the really best watchmakers in the company. The high complications, there'll be a complications workshop and these will be the really top guys and they'll, they'll assemble and adjust everything by hand, you know. For example, a minute repeater can take up to a month to assemble because every single bit will be hand adjusted as you, as you put it in there, you know. And Max said, no, we, we don't really have time for that. He said, this, this watch needs to just work when you put it together without any hand adjustment. And I was like, but that's just not possible. Max, that just can't be done. But that was what we, that was, that was the, he told me, yeah, it has to be like that. Um, it pretty much is like that, you know. So it's interesting. It was funny when I went to go pick up my watch um, because I approach perpetual calendars 
I, I think second to split second chronographs with a certain amount of trepidation, right? And, and so, like, you know, you know, it's almost like you're you're diffusing like a bomb. And so, <laughs> that's okay. a good analogy. So you're, you're like, okay. Um, and I think I was picking up from Harris, and then I went to go have dinner with Max and Harris afterwards. And I was like, Ma um, Harris, what should I do, and what should I not do? Well, maybe I should ask, what should I not do first? And he says, you can do whatever you want because it's impossible to set it incorrectly. Or, or, and I said, you've got to be kidding, right? And he says, no, that was the whole point of the watch. So I started to, to go through it and it's incredible how, yeah, it's completely intuitive, right? Yeah, that, that was it. That, that was another part of the brief as well is that it has to not be possible to, it has to not be possible to create a situation which, which would require resetting or reconfiguring with a watchmaker. It has to not ever need to go back to the manufacturer to be reset or something, you know? So whatever you, whatever stupid stuff you do to it, that was the whole, that was the idea as well. Whatever you do to it, whether you, you know, press all four pushers together or press two pushers and turn the hands backwards at the same time while the thing's trying to change date, what, or, you know, whatever you do, whatever combination of things you press or mess with, it has to not be able to upset anything in a permanent way. Because it's, it works in such a way that yeah, what, what, if you press things just right, you can upset the present month. But um, as soon as you go to the next month, everything writes itself. So there's, there's, no, there's no permanent uh, um, de desynchronization possible with the calendar. So that, that's, a, that's a very important point as well. Because uh, professional calendars are notorious for uh, if you press correctors at certain times or if you turn, turn the hands backwards with a, something pressed, what you'll do is you'll, you'll end up breaking on the tip off a tooth or breaking the tip off a, lead, a lever. And then obviously once stuff like that happens, it's game over, the watch has to go back and be, and be repaired. And, and Max had had this kind of thing happening over and over and over again. I think with, because uh, he'd, he'd worked for uh, Jay LeCoultre and Harry Winston and, and he'd had like endless nightmares with these very problematic category of watches because, they, because if, you, if you don't treat them exactly according to the instruction manual and you don't work the correctors at just the right time and if you do anything while the calendar is actually in the middle of changing, you press a corrector, you know, at midnight, you can just snap the tip off a tooth. Uh, and this is no good, you know. So it, it had to be a system which is going to be, which is going to allow any like mistakes or whatever you do, that it's going to be foolproof and things aren't going to break. So this, this was an important part of it. And like it was a very interesting challenge, although it made the watch much more, complicated to design. You see, what you what everybody needs to consider way about perpetual calendars is that yes, there are complicated watches. There are things like tourbillons, which is a very complicated mechanism. There's things like minute repeaters, which are complicated watches, but the the perpetual calendar is the absolute number one complication which allows the most interaction from the outside. Because with a perpetual calendar, the difference is you've got all these pushers and you all this stuff you can mess with. A tourbillon is lovely, very complicated, very delicate mechanism, but it just sits there and works. It just works. All you from the outside, you can't you can't react, you can't interact with it at all. All you can do is wind the watch. So you can't really set it wrong. You can't mess it up. You know, um, the perpetual calendar allows the maximum of exterior intervention. That's why it's so problematic. If you if you if you just if you ask me to just create a perpetual calendar, which 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 you'll set to the time. Uh, you'll set to the date, and then you'll you'll wind the watch permanently after that, so it'll just run forever. That's that's relatively easy. The difficulty with the perpetual calendar is to do it with all the correctors in such a way that the correctors, firstly, they do their job, and secondly, they're not going to mess up the watch if you do something wrong. That's what makes it such a such a challenge and complication is the potential for maximum intervention from the outside. Incredible. So now I want to talk about the design a little bit because I, you know, I told Max also like, listen, I think that this is the watch um, or that a lot of people think of as a contemporary icon, right? Like, so I cool. told him like, my, my favorite perpetual calendars um, amongst them would be the Paddock 3448, um, mm -hmm. probably the Royal Oak um, uh, perpetual calendar as well. Just because I thought it was cool that, a, a, you know, you had a sports watch that had a, a perpetual calendar. Yeah, in the yeah. um, and mm -hmm. that was also super thin. But I, I would put um, your watch up there uh, as well. Cool. And it, I, it's being really iconic. And then and so I asked Max, well, like, how did you guys come up with the design? And I, I sat back waiting to hear a story about his childhood. But it, <laughs> that's good. But instead, he said, actually, it was completely Stephen. Um, so like in your mind, had you already imagined uh, the design of this watch, um, obviously incorporating Max's signature balance wheel and so on? 
Yeah, they okay. Well, the design the design aspect is true. They um, ambient act didn't they didn't give me very much. They, they gave me very little um, in terms of sort of you know uh, criteria which I had to respect. The only thing really was, as you say, the big balance wheel, the big central balance wheel, because that's kind of the DNA of all of his legacy machine watches, you know. So I had I had to keep that in, and that in itself is a nightmare because you you know you've all this mechanism, and then you want to put this flipping great big balance wheel right in the middle of it. I mean it. it it couldn't be more, uh, it's the last thing you want to do. But anyway, they wanted that. Um, but apart from that, no, there wasn't a great deal said about it. The only, the, the only two things were the, um, the balance wheel and then the, the dials. If you, if you look at the Legacy Machine 1 and Legacy Machine 2, they've got those kind of, um, the kind of um, uh, uh, convex uh, enamel dials, the white dials. So it was to use those two elements, really, that was it. All of the legacy machine watches up to that point, they had been very sparse. They'd been very sort of, you know, look. Uh, if you look at the if you look at the display, you see the dials. If you look at legacy machine one, you, you see the two dials and you see the balance, but you don't really see any of the mechanism. Everything's covered with the great big plate. Similarly, uh, legacy machine two. So they had what they what Emily and F had envisaged at the start of the project was a similar approach for this. They had they had envisaged something very, you know, sort of uh, low key. Uh, understated, so we would have the professional calendar dials displayed, but they weren't expecting to see any of them, any of the mechanism at all. They had, they had imagined it would be covered. And as a, as the thing as the thing grew, it's interesting way, and I think back, you know, it, the, for me, watch design is a very it's a it's a sort of an organic process. You know, I the, the answer to your question is I didn't start out with a vision of how this thing was going to look. I, I really didn't know how it was going to look at all. I always think. Uh, there's this there's this great bit. I don't know if you ever read The Lord of the Rings by by J R R Tolkien. Well, if you read the if you read the introduction, he says in the introduction, "This tale grew in the telling." And I always think, for me, watch design is always a bit like that. They they I started with the initial concept, as I told you, of the 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 28 days and the wheel with the moving teeth inside. I started from that point, and the watch grew outwards from that point. You know, now I had no idea what it was going to look like in the end. I didn't know how the mechanism was going to all work until I actually started to design it. You see, but when I when I design stuff, when I design a whole thing or just one lever or just one spring, I'm always looking for this kind of gut, this punch in the gut. I'm always looking for this feeling. And when I when I've got the design the way I want it to look, I always get this kind of yes. That's 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 what I'm looking for. And um, it's not a kind of mathematically calculated. It has to be this or that. Uh, it, it just when I get it right, and I, I get the it's, it's a feeling, it's a gut feeling that this that's what I'm trying to get. And often when I'm trying to design something, and it's not coming together, or it's not, you know the lever doesn't look the way I want, or the the the, the spring is not the right shape, or something that I'm not happy about. It. It's like you, you you try and try and try in different ways, and suddenly when you get it, all the pennies drop, and you're there, you know. And it's almost like I sometimes compare it to having the part. It's like whenever you get it, whenever you get it right, it's like, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, of course, it, it could only look like that. It couldn't look any other way once you nail it. And it's as if when you're designing the part, it's like the part's already designed and the part is hidden inside a glass filled with sand. And so the part is in there and the part exists. But I just can't see it. And when, I, when I'm designing the part, what I'm doing is I'm pouring the sand away. And, 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 and the, the part is revealed, but it's, it's as if the part always existed in, the, in its ideal form. I'm just, what I'm just trying to do is I'm trying to pour the sound away. So whenever I get it looking the way I want, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's an instant reaction. That's what I'm after. So the whole watch sort of designed itself in that way from the initial concept of the mechanism to all the different complicated bits of the correctors and so on. The whole thing grew organically. And as it grew, I sort of felt more and more, what we, we do not want to cover this up. But the point of this watch surely is the mechanism itself, because the mechanism is, it's, it's new. It's, I think if I may say so, it's quite innovative. And it's, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff to be seen. And me personally, my, my interest is, my, my really deep fascination and interest in all things mechanical, be it watches or steam engines or, you know, um, boat engines or whatever on earth it is, gearboxes, whatever it is, my, my interest in everything te technical and mechanical is always how does it work and seeing what it does. I always want to climb right inside the, the, the gearbox to see what's going on in there. You know what I mean? I want to get as close to it as possible. I want to see the things. For me, that's the interest. That's always the passion is the interest is to see how it works. So I thought we've designed, designed all this stuff. 
It's looking really nice. The last thing we want to do is cover all up with this kind of LM1, LM2 big plate thing you see. So I, I remember saying to Max, uh, I remember having a discussion with him and I said, look, what I think we should do is we should, we should not do that cover at all. We should actually, let's, let's use the dials that you want to use, but we'll, I'll make them float. I'll make them float above the mechanism. So it's going to look as though they're, you, you won't really see how they're attached. They're just going to float there. They don't have to cover up. They'll be just enough that you can actually read the date and read the time and so on. And we won't cover anything else. We'll just have these dials floating as if in midair. And Max was like, mm, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm <laughs> really not sure. And I do remember I got to compromise and say something like, okay, well, we could try that, but we'll have to do a second version of the watch where everything's covered. <laughs> that was the, that was the that was the deal that I managed to broker was that he would cons we would consider it and have a try but only if there could be a fully covered version and then we continued with the design that was okay I to be honest with you at that point I thought I had a I had a I had like a I had a feeling that this was going to look good and and once we made this deal to be perfectly honest I didn't think again about covering it up. I didn't. I didn't integrate that into the design because I knew in my gut. I knew that once they saw, once MBNF and Max once they saw the thing as I sort of could see it coming together, they wouldn't be interested in covering it. So I, although I agreed to do that, I actually sorry Max. I actually didn't continue with the design for covering it all up. That's so I cool. sort of went with my gut. So so they they the uh, the design of the thing actually is is contrary to what MBNF had really wanted, but. I felt strongly that this is how it should look. Um, in fairness to MBNF, they, they, I suppose they put their trust in me. You know, they didn't insist that, okay, it has to be the way we want it. They were ready, they were open enough to, okay, we weren't considering doing it like that, but if you really think it needs to be like that, Stephen, let's go with it and we'll see where it leads. Well, amazingly, I think Max got two watches out of you because, uh, because you had to put the escapement on the back of the watch, you got the split escapement <laughs> as well. Right, well, that's so uh, pretty cool. Well, that's you see, that's true. And again, it goes back to what you said before about the you know the initial criteria. The initial criteria only really were, as I say, the balance, the big balance, and the dials. And um, the problem with the big balance being right in the middle of this complicated mechanism is that there was just it wasn't there was nowhere to put the escapement on the on LM one. The escapement's on the front of the watch. You could see it there, but this was simply impossible. There was no way to put the escapement on the front. And I thought about trying to put the escapement in inside the center of the watch. You know. You wouldn't be able to see it, but it, it just it wasn't working because the barrels are in there because it's got two big barrels for the 72 hour power reserve. You see, so the whole inside of the mech, the movement itself is filled with wheels and barrels. So there was nowhere for it. So then I, you know, again, logically, I just thought, okay, well, why not do the world's longest balance stuff and just the, the, the whole balance stuff will pass all the way through the movement and right out the other side and we'll put the escapement on the back of the watch. So for me, I thought this, this was, uh, I was, I, I was quite pleased that I came up with a solution. I thought, well, this is okay. This is going to work. But I remember so well how it worked. Was I was living at this hotel, um, MBNF in Geneva. So every four weeks, I would get the train up to Geneva and we would have a meeting and I would show them, you know, the pro progress I'd made and everything. So we'd all sit around and it was like the Spanish Inquisition. I, I, said, I, would, sit, I would sit there and they would just, uh, everybody would uh, throw stones at me, you know. So uh, I explained about the long balance staff and then being after after all, nah, nah, that's not going to work. No. <laughs> all the guys were like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think so, Stephen. It's not going to, it'll be, it, you know, all sorts of problems with uh, cantilevered effects and things. And, and I, and, see, I, and I, that's one of those situations that because nobody's ever made a balance staff as long as that, we, nobody, you can't really be certain. The problem with that balance staff is not just the length of the balance staff, it's the fact that the wheel, the wheel is not anywhere near the center. The balance staff's that long, but the wheel is right up here. Right. If the wheel was more central, I think people would be less nervous. But the fact that the wheel had been right up here, that was the problem. So the deal I struck with MBNF was that what, what I said was, okay, we need to prove if it works or not. So I said, what, what we'll do is I will make the balance staff myself. This is before the watch existed. We're still designing, okay? I just wanted a proof of concept of the balance staff itself way. So I said, okay, you give me the LM1 prototype, the prototype movement, which they have in the safe. You give me the LM1 prototype, okay? I will make the super long balance staff myself, the 12 millimeter, 12 millimeter balance staff. And I will 
mounted on the LM1 prototype using extension pillars on the LM1 prototype to mount the, the bridge right up in the air so that we can put, if you like, the long balance staff on the LM1 movement. And I said, if that works, we'll test it. And if you guys are satisfied, we'll move on. So actually, that, so I, I've, I have a photograph of that, if you want to see it. I, I photographed this ridiculous thing that I built, and that's how we proved the... Um, that's how we proved that it actually it, it would work, and from then it was okay. I mean, I can show you very quickly where if you want to see. Amazing, yes, of course. You go to yeah, here we are. Yes, that's incredible. <laughs> so you see, you see the LM one movement. You see the LM on the two dials. Yeah. And then you see the, the thing at the back is the big extension pillar, right. built, and that's the LM one balance. But it's the, the the length of the balance staff is like it would be on on the perpetual eventually. But at this point, when I did this, the petrol perpetual didn't exist. I was still in the middle of designing it. Right. Incredible. So yes, my last question for you, Stephen, is what are you working on now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, well, listen, um, I, I, uh, you, you know how it is. You know how it is. I just, I, I can't discuss it. I'm so sorry. I can't discuss it, but uh, it's hopefully something interesting. Excellent. I have no doubt that it will be. Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Um, it's been a revelation. Uh, you're a great guy to talk to and, and thank you so much for the insights. It's, it, that, thank you. It, it, it's really lived up to all my expectations. In fact, surpassed it as well. Oh, really? What were you expecting? I'm intrigued. What were yeah, you like, expecting? There's this genius watchmaking dude out in uh, Belfast and, and clearly you are. <laughs> I've sort of, I've made a lot of effort to sort of stay under the radar. You know, like nobody really knows anything about me because I, I, uh, I don't really have any interest in being like that. Well, sometimes people have asked me, or do you not want to do what's sort of your own name or have your own brand or this kind of thing? You know, but I, that, doesn't really, that doesn't really appeal to me. So I tend to be quite unknown. Most people don't really know anything about me. And that, I kind of like that way. You know, that's, that suits me quite well. You I know? get it. Yeah. You know, I think it's the work that's important to you. Um, so if I ever end up in Belfast, though, please allow me to buy you a meal and, and let's go have a beer together or a couple of beers together. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure we'll meet at a bit. You see, once I always, <clears throat> it's like this, the, LM, the professional calendar comes out and then I'm, you know, Max wheels me out to various events and I have to talk to people and stuff like this. And then and then we go to the next development and nobody sees me for several years, you see. So hopefully once once something comes out again, I will I will re reemerge from the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Have a wishing you a wonderful day and really appreciate your time. No problem. Wait. Listen, anytime, call me anytime and I look forward. Maybe we'll meet at an event sometime and as you say, we'll get a drink. That sounds amazing. Take care, brother. Good man. See you. Bye bye.